Paradise is the place we need. I feel the peace, feel the peace inside of me. Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown with another episode of Interfaith Issues, where we discuss the issues of common interest to the three Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Today I'm going to be talking about the subject of where is the Christ in Christianity. Now that title might strike people as a little unusual if they have not been introduced to the concept before. The reason for the title, Where is the Christ in Christianity, is simply that many who read the Christian scriptures encounter a paradox that they have difficulty resolving. And that paradox is that the teachings of Jesus Christ often are found to be seemingly at odds with the tenets of Christian faith. Now, I would like to begin by backing up a step to the Old Testament. We all know, of course, Christianity is based upon the New Testament. But let's back up for a minute to the Old Testament. The scripture that Jesus Christ held up as the scripture of his time. We have to remember that Jesus Christ was an Orthodox Jew. This is why he is frequently referred to as Rabbi Jesus. The Old Testament was the book that Rabbi Jesus held up as the book of laws of his time. These were the laws that he taught to his disciples. And so it is important for us to take a speculative look at the Old Testament. Let's begin with Genesis 32, where it is recorded that Jacob wrestled with another man. No. Uh, an angel? No, although it might say that in the translation. No, it's actually written that Jacob wrestled with God. Now, modern translations have tried to pretty much make this difficulty go away. They translate it as man or angel, but we have to read the scriptures in the foundational language in which they were recorded. And when we do this, we find that the Old Testament records that Jacob wrestled with God. Now, let's put this into perspective. Our universe is vast. How vast exactly is it? Well, take 240, add 21 zeros after it, and that's how many miles the universe is in diameter. 240 with 21 zeros after it is seven sets of three zeros with commas. It's a number so vast, I'm not even sure if anybody knows the name for it. And on top of that, within this known universe, we have over a billion galaxies, and the universe, despite its vastness, is still expanding at 90% the speed of light. Now, this is creation of our creator, and we are to believe that Jacob, a man wrestled with the creator of this vast universe, not only wrestled with him, but as the Bible records, prevailed. It records that Jacob prevailed in wrestling against God. Now, as I said, modern translations have tried to escape from this difficulty by translating that Jacob wrestled with an angel or wrestled with a man. That's not what the foundational scripture says. And we have to look at the foundational scripture if we are going to get a true feel for the accuracy of these writings. Now, unreliability is a recurring problem in the Old Testament. One of the largest examples of unreliability is to be found in 2 Samuel 24, 1, compared with 1 Chronicles 21, 1. In 2 Samuel 24, 1, it reads, quote, Again the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. Fair enough. What did it say? The anger of the Lord 
and he moved to David. What does 1 Chronicles 21.1 say? Quote, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Here we have two passages describing the same historical event in very clear, unequivocal language. One speaks of God, the other speaks of Satan. Now, we have to ask ourselves at this point, is there any possible way to rectify this? In another passage, as I told you, Genesis 32, 24 through 30, it records a man, Jacob, as having wrestled with God. Here we find two passages, one speaking of God, one speaking of Satan, describing the same historical event. In both of these passages, there is no possible way to rectify this inconsistency. So, which was it? Was it the Lord or was it Satan? We don't know. But what we do know is that it renders the Old Testament unreliable as a book of Scripture. As God is all-knowing, all-powerful, perfect, and all-reliable, he does not make the simplest of mistakes. A human being might. And we have to assume, okay, maybe this mistake came from a scribe. But if the revelation has been passed down to us in this time, with these errors existing within the text, and we cannot trust that portion, then what portion can we trust? Now, Christians would like to believe that the New Testament is free from such errors. Christians would like to say, well, okay, that's, you know, that's, that's Old Testament. Let's not worry about that. We have the New Testament. We don't base our faith upon the Old Testament. That's of historical significance because the New Testament replaced the Old Testament. Well, it's a fair enough argument if it bears water. And in order to analyze that, we have to look at the New Testament and consider whether or not there are similar inconsistencies. So let's do that. To begin with, where Jesus and his family allegedly fled when they were persecuted, one gospel, Matthew, records the family having fled. Another, Luke, records the exact same scenario. One records the family having fled to Nazareth. The other records the family having fled to Egypt. Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Luke 11, 2 through 4. They differ over the wording of the Lord's Prayer. Now, think about what this means. We're talking about the Lord's Prayer. We're not talking about a little esoteric little-known uh, prayer. We're talking about the Lord's Prayer, the most commonly quoted Christian prayer in the world throughout the history of Christianity. And yet we have two different versions of it. It is described in two Gospels, and the wording does not agree. How much does the wording not agree? Over the last several years, the Jesus Seminar has compiled over 300 fellows of the Jesus Seminar. These are leading Christian scholars who represent their various faiths. They are at the top of the academic and the theological field, and they analyze the Christian scriptures. They analyze the foundational manuscripts, not the ones that we read in our translations into whatever language. No, they analyze the manuscripts in their original language. How big is the difference between the two versions of the Lord's Prayer? It is so large that the Jesus Seminar agrees that the only word Jesus Christ reportedly stated that they can agree upon that he stated was Father. Now we're talking about the prayer that starts, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, da 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 da. But as famous as this prayer is, as much as people rely upon this prayer and think that these were the actual words of Jesus, the preeminent theologians and Christian scholars of the Jesus Seminar have concluded that the only word of 
the Lord's Prayer that can be definitively traced to Jesus Christ is the word Father. So this gives us some idea of the problems that exist in the New Testament as well. Matthew and John disagree over another point of critical importance. In Matthew 11, 13 through 14, and uh, chapter 17, 11 through 13, uh, and John 1, 21. These two Gospels disagree over whether John the Baptist was Elijah or not. In one case, John the Baptist described as Elijah. In another case, he is disavowed as Elijah. Again, you can't have it both ways. And in a book of God, we don't expect to find this kind of discrepancy. Now, that's enough information for all of us to chew on for a few minutes. So let's take a break, and we'll come back shortly. Welcome back, and let's continue with our discussion on this segment of interfaith issues. We are talking about where is the Christ in Christianity. We don't expect to find discrepancies like who carried the cross. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Simon carried the cross. In John, Jesus Christ carried the cross. Again, which one was it? We don't expect to find differences over little things, such as what was the color of the robe that he was wearing? Scarlet, as in one gospel, or purple, as in another? Did the Roman soldiers put gall in the wine, or did they put myrrh? Look at the gospels. You will find parallel stories that do not agree. Was Jesus crucified before the third hour, as in Mark 15, 25, or after the sixth hour, as in John 19, 14 through 15? Now, before the third hour and after the sixth hour, there is no way of reconciling these. There is no way that that time frame can overlap. You cannot have it both ways. And we are only talking about the events that are recorded leading up to the alleged crucifixion. After the alleged crucifixion, all similarity between the stories becomes almost unrecognizable. Now, that's a hefty challenge. And I would challenge the serious and the sincere to go and read the Gospels, look at them side by side, and compare the stories after the alleged crucifixion to see exactly on what details they agree. One of the most important details that they do not agree on is the last words of Jesus Christ. Now, think about this. Throughout time, whenever you have a famous personality, when that person is dying, their followers, the people who, who love that person or emulate that person or want to just write history books about that person, they hang upon their deathbed waiting for their last words. You can even find books about this. There's one book called Famous Last Words. And what is interesting is that there is no disagreement about the last words of the famous personalities in books like Famous Last Words. But when it comes to Jesus Christ, one gospel records that his last words were, it is finished. Another gospel records that his last words were, it is finished? No, not at all. The other gospel records that his last words are, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Which is it? Again, you can't have both. You can't have he said this and then said that, and they were both his last words. No, if you said this and then you said that, this is no longer his last words. These are only a few of a long list of scriptural inconsistencies, and they underscore the difficulty in embracing the New Testament as unadulterated scripture, scripture that we can be comfortable, be comfortable hanging our salvation upon, trusting that this book will get us into paradise because it is letter perfect and we can be assured that it is pristine revelation from God because quite clearly it is not. There are inconsistencies that cannot be rectified with one another. Hence the question, where is the Christ in Christianity? On one hand, we have a religion that is named after Jesus Christ. And if you ask any Christian, what is the foundation of your faith? What does it mean to be Christian? They will say it means to follow the teachings and the example of Jesus Christ. But now, if that is the case, if that is the case, why do we find such 
a large disparity between what Jesus Christ teaches and what the church teaches as the tenets of Trinitarian Christian faith. Let me give you some examples. Jesus Christ taught Old Testament law. That's why, as I said in the beginning of this talk, he's known as Rabbi Jesus. Paul negated it. Jesus Christ taught that God is one God. The Pauline theologians derived the Trinity. Jesus called himself the Son of Man 88 times. 88 times he called himself the Son of Man. Not once did he ever call himself the Son of God in a literal, begotten, not made sense. What did Paul call Jesus Christ? The Son of God. What do Christians know Jesus Christ as now? Allegedly the Son of God. We have to ask ourselves, when we are following the tenets of Christian faith, or those who follow the tenets of Christian faith, what are they adhering to more closely? The teachings of Jesus Christ or the teachings of Paul? And make no mistake about it, they are not the same. The teachings of Paul, as I just stated, in most cases are contradictory to the teachings of Jesus Christ, negating the Old Testament law, denying the unity of God, denying the direct accountability, meaning praying directly to God in, instead of praying to a saint or an intercessor, identifying Jesus Christ as a man and not as the Son of God. These are critical points upon which Paul and Jesus Christ were at odds. Paul was not only at odds with the teachings of Jesus Christ, but he was corrected by Jesus' disciples. It is well documented in the New Testament, the animosity between Peter and Paul, the animosity between James and Paul. So again, the title of this talk, Where is the Christ in Christianity? Because what we are finding is that what Jesus Christ taught is not the foundation of the tenets of faith encountered in Trinitarian churches of this time. Rather, the Trinitarian churches of this time are based predominantly upon the teachings of Paul. How recognizable is this? Is this something that I am seeing for the first time nobody else has seen? Is this something that has escaped the knowledge of Christian scholars? Not at all. They are well aware of it, but they are shy to talk about it. Let me read some quotes. Lehman contributes, quote, what Paul proclaimed as Christianity was sheer heresy, which could not be based on the Jewish or Essene faith or on the teaching of Rabbi Jesus. But as Schoenfeld says, the Pauline heresy became the foundation of Christian orthodoxy and the legitimate church was disowned as heretical. Was this only to be found in the writings of Lehman? No. Barty Ehrman, probably the leading scholar of biblical textual criticism alive today, speaking upon this very subject, commented, quote, Paul's view was not universally accepted, or one might argue even widely accepted. Even more striking, Paul's own letters indicate that there were outspoken, sincere, and active Christian leaders who vehemently disagreed with him on this score and considered Paul's views to be a corruption of the true message of Christ. One should always bear in mind that in this very letter of Galatians, Paul indicates that he confronted Peter over just such issues. He disagreed, that is, even with Jesus' closest disciple. Commenting on some of the early Christians in the pseudo-Clementine literature, Barty Ehrman wrote, Paul has corrupted the true faith on a brief vision, which he has doubtless misconstrued. Paul is thus the enemy of the apostles, not the chief of them. He is outside the true faith, a heretic to be banned, not an apostle to be followed. Joel Carmichael, quote, we are a universe away from Jesus. If Jesus came only to fulfill the law and the prophets, if he thought that not one iota, not a dot would pass from the law, 
that the cardinal commandment was, quote, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and that no one was good but God. What would he have thought of Paul's handiwork? Paul's triumph meant the final obliteration of the historic Jesus. There are many others who have made similar comments. The point is that in analyzing Christianity, we have to choose who to take the teachings from. If we are choosing to take our teachings from the prophet Jesus, let's do it. Let's take from his teachings. Let's go and buy a red letter Bible that records all the words of Jesus Christ in red and we will find everything that Jesus said very clear. You will find everything that I have spoken about in this last 20 minutes. You will find him speaking of one God. You will find him speaking of himself as the Son of Man. You will find him speaking of direct accountability. You will find him speaking of the fact that he was an ethnic prophet, etc., etc. But if you choose to follow the teachings of Paul, well, then you are welcome to follow the Pauline, Trinitarian Christianity that prevails in this time. But before you do that, I would suggest one thing. Let's take a close look at these issues I have described. Jesus Christ teaching that there is only one God, teaching that the prophets were men and sons of men, teaching direct accountability. What other religion, what other of the Abrahamic religions conveys these simple, true values? If you answered Islam, you'd be correct. Here is a religion that honors Jesus Christ as the prophet, that recognizes his humanity, recognizes the truth of the revelation that he conveyed, but at the same time recognizes the very human corruptions, whether intentional or not, that crept into that revelation over time. At the same time, Islam is a religion of Tawheed, belief in the oneness of God, as Jesus professed. And it is a religion that fulfills everything that Jesus Christ himself spoke of. If you want to learn more about this, expand your knowledge on the subject, please go to my website, www.leveltruth.com. Look at the first of my series of books, Misguided, and you can carry it further from there. For now, this is Dr. Brown concluding this issue of Interfaith Issues, and looking forward to the next time we meet on this channel. Peace, and thank you for sharing this time with me. I feel the peace. Inside of me, a complete tranquility. I remember Allah, He remembers me. Feel the peace, feel the breeze, fresh, pure, holy peace. Peace in you, peace in me, peace for everybody, fresh.